Hi guys, I'm Eric Voss, and now that Logan has been out in theaters for a little while now, my therapist says I can talk about it without breaking down sobbing. So, I wanted to take a deeper look at the film to explore all the reasons that make it great. Now, obviously, Logan isn't like most other superhero movies that we've seen. It's less about connecting to the continuity of the other films and setting up a bunch of Easter eggs, although there are a few fun references, and I'll point those out. And if you want an explanation of how Logan fits in with the X-Men, I made another video about that, but in this video, I'm gonna go through Logan and point out all the other details that I found interesting. All the choices made by Hugh Jackman, James Mangold, and the creative team to make Logan unique to the genre of superhero films. And obviously, spoiler warning if you haven't seen Logan yet, but still clicked on a YouTube video breaking down the film, somehow that's on me. Let's get started. Okay, looking at these opening images, the first shot of the film is Logan rising up in the frame as the carjack lifts his limo. I love this shot. It's almost like Logan is being dragged out of his drunken despair spare for one last fight. And when the thugs shoot him in the chest, the title of the film appears as he struggles to get back up. And I think this is foreshadowing where Logan will end up at the end of the film, bleeding out on the ground as his powers fail him. Now, this scene with Logan tearing all these guys to pieces is already the most violent that we've ever seen Wolverine. James Mangold is using this opening scene to set the tone for the rest of the film. Like, brace yourself, this Wolverine is gonna be way more extreme than the version of the character that you remember, but also kind of the version we always wanted. Now, Logan's R rating was a decision made early on in the process. Mangold wanted to be able to make a more adult film where scenes could run longer and be shot more poetically without having to play for a younger, more attention-deprived audience. Now, before I move on to the rest of the movie, I haven't forgotten about that opening Deadpool scene that played before the movie. I actually made another video about that, but if things seemed missing from that video, it's because we made it before the fuller version of the No Good Deed scene came out online. And that version had a few changes from the original theatrical version, like Wade is listening to a different song, and there's a Stan Lee cameo. Still, you should check out my other video because I point out some Easter eggs and explain how that old man in the sea synopsis connects with the story of Logan. Anyway, back to Logan. Notice how this limo has a digital display showing Logan's license with the name James Hallett. That's his birth name, which we saw in X-Men Origins. But this modern digital display is one of the only instances of futuristic tech in this whole movie. The production designer said that originally the limo was going to have a touchscreen poker table in the back, but Mangold ultimately scrapped it because it would be too distracting. They felt that too many superhero movies include anachronistic, hologram, and touch display technology, and they didn't want Logan to look that flashy or futuristic. Instead, they shot Logan with limited CGI spectacle, making it more of a true modern western and road film that focused on the relationships between the characters. There were also a few clues here that hint at the later reveal of why the mutants are disappearing. First, there's a radio call-in show where a conspiracy nut job claims Poison water, mutants, it's all connected. Now, the theory is ignored, but the caller ends up being spot on. Xander Rice actually was dispensing an anti-mutant toxin into consumer products. Also, when these party bros are chanting USA through the sunroof, check out what they're drinking. That looks like an energy drink, similar to the one that we see Laura drinking from at the gas station later on. The production designer added this subtle detail because he didn't want to overwhelm us with the logistics of Rice's tainted high fructose corn syrup being consumed by everyone. Just a few little details to justify it enough for people watching closely. And yes, there are some connections to the comics other people have already pointed out, like Logan's clothes look similar to his appearance in Death of Wolverine, and Greenwood Cemetery does show up a few times in the Marvel comics. And of course, this whole version of the character is based loosely on the old man Logan comics, with Logan as an old, grizzled recluse on a violent road trip. But really, other than that, this movie is nothing like that comic, which is super insane and stylized. And it contains a ton of Marvel property characters that Fox doesn't have the rights to. The author of Old Man Logan actually suggested early on that they could try to adapt it, swapping out Hulk with Blob and Hawkeye with Cyclops after he like lost his eyewear and had to cover his eyes the whole movie. But ultimately, Mangold and Jackman just went in a different direction. Anyway, moving on to this scene with Logan and Donald Pierce, Boyd Holbrook, the part cybernetic leader of the Reavers. A few interesting things here. One, notice how Pierce keeps referring to Logan and the other former X-Men like they're celebrities, saying he's a fan. I actually had a theory about why this 
movie plays up the former celebrity status of the X-Men and why X-Men comics exist in this movie that I get into my other video. Now, it's kind of a stretch. It has to do with secret codes and X-Men turned comic book artists, but it's super interesting, so go check it out. And there's also a few other possible references here. Pierce says that they found a few torn up guys with police thinking it was either caused by Freddy Krueger or a tiger, one of which is fictional and the other extinct. But those also seem like descriptions for Wolverine and Sabretooth. And Leaf Schreiber Sabretooth was going to appear in this movie, but they ended up going another way. I'll talk about that later. And then there was my favorite joke reference in this movie, which I brought up in the other video. Pierce says to Logan, I heard you was in Phoenix. Yeah, he was. Okay, moving on to Logan's hideout at this smelting factory south of the border. Now, there's some interesting history behind this. Mangold's original idea was to make Logan and Charles live in an abandoned bourbon distillery in Kentucky, with Charles's room being an old bourbon tank. But then, Mangold was inspired by current events, specifically the refugee crisis and the issues at the Mexican-American border. So, they moved the setting to El Paso. And Patrick Stewart said in an interview that this plot point of border crossing became even more relevant as time went on. It may just be a case of life catching up with art because the movie was conceived and the ideas were first being discussed and the script in development before we had found ourselves worldwide in the situation that we are in with hundreds and hundreds of dispossessed, abandoned people who, just like the three principal good characters in our movie, are trying to get to a border and cross it. Now, at this point, the idea was to make Logan's hideout an old oil refinery, but the production designer realized that that would be too large and sprawling. And after research, he found smelting factories are smaller and more intimate, more like a home. And then a location scout showed him a photo in New Mexico of a tipped over water tower, and that locked it in for him. And I pointed this out in trailer breakdowns, but the interior of this water tank was indeed intended to evoke Cerebro. Mangold liked how the holes looked like a star field, and and the metal dome keeps Charles's mind trapped inside, a reversal of how Cerebro works. And this scene between Charles and Logan is a key moment between the characters. Mangold wanted a long, grounded scene early on, depicting Logan as a domestic caretaker, and Charles as a plausibly senile old man suffering from Alzheimer's, who at times doesn't recognize Logan and then ends up saying bitter, cruel things to him. Patrick Stewart said that he lost 21 pounds for the role, and that's actually Hugh Jackman character him in these scenes. And this scene kind of implies some answers about this movie's timeline. Like Charles references the Statue of Liberty incident and Logan's cage fighting past, both from the first X-Men film. But really, I think these are just meant to remind us of the film that we first saw these two men together and how far they've come. Also notice when Logan says, we both could use some sleep. I think that's a subtle foreshadowing of what's to come for these two, both the characters and the actors who make their final appearances in the roles. Then in Logan's bedroom, we get some other references to past Wolverine films with his katana sword from his adventures in Japan and the Wolverine. Also his dog tags, which we saw in X-Men Origins. So again, even though a lot of these events were supposed to be erased or rewritten in Days of Future Past, this movie really doesn't want us to think too hard about the timeline. But I want to talk about the look of Logan here. This movie's director of photography was John Matheson. He's the same guy who shot X-Men First Class. Matheson explained that unlike First Class, nothing in Logan is meant to look attractive or glamorized. Everything Everything's gritty and dirty and sun damaged. And the way he achieved that was by using just one overhead light to look like the sun, so that the light streaks down the actor's face and hollows out the eyes, makes the scars stand out, and make Logan's beard look stubbly and unshaved. And I think this lighting effect does a lot to accentuate Logan's age and exhaustion throughout the film. And the next scene makes Logan's deterioration even clearer, with Caliban calling out his health problems and his failing vision, which is why we see Logan wearing new glasses in the next scene. Caliban also returns Logan's adamantium bullet, which we also saw in X-Men Origins. Now, I've talked about Caliban in my trailer breakdowns, but I like the details they added with this Steven Merchant version. For one, his skin burns when it's exposed to sunlight, making that Nosferatu joke he made earlier literal. Also, his mutant tracking ability seems to come with a heightened sense of smell, like he can smell the adamantium in the bullet and the fact that Logan's body is being poisoned from the inside. This sniff gesture gives a little tactility to Caliban 
man's powers. Like we can kind of see it in action as opposed to some abstract mental process. Okay, moving on, when Logan runs into Gabriella and Laura at the motel, we get another quick clue about the mutant mystery with this newspaper headline, lack of mutant births, stump researchers. Is there something in the water? Um, yes, there is. Don't drink it. In fact, don't eat, drink, or consume anything. Okay, great. And I actually think that idea of the water supply being tainted is another concept taken directly from real life headlines with dangerous traces of lead found in the drinking water in Flint, Michigan. Now they discovered that in 2014, but many residents had been claiming that for years with it just being brushed off as paranoia, much like this theory in Logan is. Okay, moving back to the hideout where Laura ends up with Logan and Charles and Pierce shows up with the rest of the Reavers and here's where this already violent movie just goes berserk. It turns out Laura is holding a severed Reaver head in this shot and even though I spotted that in the trailer it's still super intense to see her just like bowl it over like it's nothing. And real quick I like how right as Laura springs into action we get this close-up of Charles smiling pretty much reflecting what we're all feeling in this moment like oh an 11 year old girl is murdering a bunch of people and getting harpooned. This is great. Really I think Charles is just happy to see Laura act like Logan does. He notices her claws and her rage, and he hears Pierce say that she heals. For Charles, this is the first sign of hope that the X-Men legacy may move on with a new generation. We also see Laura's foot claw, which is how X-23 was introduced in the animated series and the comics. Later, Charles explains that the two sets of claws mirror the lioness, which uses its front claws for hunting and its back claws defensively. And that's exactly what Laura does here, using her hands to attack and her foot claw only when she's being held down. Now, James Mangold mentioned a few movies that he used as inspiration for Logan, one of which was The Gauntlet. That's where Clint Eastwood has to escort a woman from Vegas to Phoenix on the run from some crooked cops. And this chase in the limo feels a lot like the chase scenes from that movie. Eastwood was actually an inspiration for both the concept art for Logan and Jackman's performance. Mangold also said that he drew from movies like Paper Moon and Little Miss Sunshine, which are both road movies featuring young girls. Also, the production designer said that they had to build three different versions of this limo, one for exterior shots that could get shot up with bullets, one for interior shots, and then a third one that could go 100 miles an hour in the desert with insane suspension. That's why in some shots a car looks nearly torn to pieces, but then it could still move powerfully over desert terrain. And then when Logan and Charles watch the video on Gabriella's phone, we begin to get some answers on Laura's backstory along with the other mutants. And we get a quick shot of Wolverine's DNA, which is the same DNA that we saw being taken from the Weapon X facility in the post credit scene after X-Men Apocalypse. Okay, moving on to this gas station scene, which we saw in the trailer, and a lot of people are wondering why Laura isn't affected by this anti-mutant toxin and all this junk food and energy drink. I think it's because she isn't a natural mutant. Like she was artificially engineered from Logan's DNA. So maybe the gene therapy doesn't affect artificially enhanced people. And then later when Logan sees the second half of Gabriella's video, we get a shot of Laura cutting herself, which is actually something Laura does in the Innocence Lost series in the comics. We also hear Gabriella describe the new X-24 clone as something without a soul. Now, Mangold said that he conceived X-24 as a version of Wolverine from the darkest time in his life, the Weapon X days. So basically, everything Logan is, physically, without the soul that he gained from all the relationships that he's had over his lifetime. Okay, moving on to Oklahoma City. Now, in an early version of the story, they were gonna go to Vegas, but Mangold insisted that the direction of this road trip be kinda linear and not go too far west. However, this was shot in Harris Casino in New Orleans, where apparently it's illegal for children to even set foot inside a casino. Like, legally, the governor of the state would have had to escort Daphne Keene around the casino premises. So, even though most of this movie was shot on location, in camera, with with practical effects, these shots of Laura simply walking through the casino had to be shot on a soundstage using green screen. And upstairs in the hotel room, Laura and Charles watched the classic Western film Shane. And Shane was another huge inspiration for this film. It features a lone fighter putting himself in danger to protect a family from assholes encroaching on their land, which is exactly what Logan does with the Morrison family later on. And then of course, Shane's iconic ending absolutely inspires Logan's ending, with Laura repeating these final lines that Shane gives this teary-eyed, dopey-looking kid before limping off to his death, maybe? I think it's meant for interpretation. Also, apparently Patrick Stewart improvised this line about seeing Shane in a theater as a young boy, like one of the actor's earliest memories was seeing the film in a cinema in Great Britain. And while this is happening, Logan flips through the transigen medical files, and briefly we see Bobby's paperwork, which says that his source DNA was Christopher Bradley. That was Dominic Monaghan's character from X-Men Origins, aka Bolt, 
Bolt, which is why that we see Bobby have similar electrical abilities. And then when Logan confronts Laura about her comic books, he says that the stories were fiction from a self-promoting asshole in a fucking leotard. Now to me, this line implies that the person behind these comics was one of the X-Men. In my other video, I speculate that this self-promoting asshole could be Cyclops, who might have put these Eden coordinates in the comics to lead mutant refugees to a sanctuary in Canada. And apparently there was a deleted scene from an earlier version of the story that involved Logan running into a sort of underground railroad for mutants, run by another unknown mutant, and I think that could have been Cyclops. Also, as I mentioned before, Lee Schreiber's Sabretooth was supposed to be in the story, but he was left out because James Mangold didn't want a bunch of other mutant cameos. I feel like Sabretooth could have shown up in this bar that Logan goes to when he realizes Eden coordinates were from the comics. And moving on to Charles's mass seizure in the hotel. Notice that when Logan struggles to walk down the hallway, he looks super restrained, and that's because Hugh Jackman had two crew guys restraining him with ropes. But really, have you seen Hugh Jackman? I'm surprised they didn't need six guys. And then after they escape the casino, news on the radio compares the event to the Westchester incident. And that's the thing back east that Pierce referred to earlier, which ended in Charles's brain being categorized as a WMD. But before Logan turns off the radio, we hear that 600 people were injured and it took the lives of seven mutants, including several of the, and it gets cut off, but I assume she was gonna say X-Men. I mean, what else was she gonna say? Cast a Big Bang Theory? I don't know. And in my other video, I speculated that those seven could be Storm, Cyclops, Rogue, Jean Grey, Beast, Iceman, Kitty Pride, maybe also Nightcrawler and Colossus, but we don't ever know exactly, and I'm not sure we ever will. Now, why doesn't the film go into this in greater detail? The screenwriter said that an earlier draft did actually include a flashback to this Westchester incident, but Mangold wanted to keep the story in the present to focus on the characters, not the timeline or the details. And he preferred the Westchester incident to be kind of mysterious and on the peripherals of the story. And honestly, I think the film is better off for it. Like, we don't need specific answers to all these questions. We just need to know that there was some tragic event in the past that caused Charles and Logan to be super guilty. And then in the meantime, nerds like us can make videos like this and speculate all kinds of theories on it. Now, if you had any doubts that this movie is a Western, the one time that we see Charles use his powers intentionally, it's to herd a bunch of wild horses. Damn, give this man a lasso. And this family dinner scene again references Charles and Logan's time at his institute. And apparently an earlier script contained a line where Logan is asked if he's married and Charles says, yes, but he killed her. Ooh. But that line was left out because Mangold wanted this to be a purely picturesque, pleasant evening. And when Logan takes Charles upstairs, Charles says, this is what life looks like. A home, people who love each other, a safe place. You should take a moment and feel it. And the reason this line is so important is for Logan's entire existence, his regeneration and more or less immortality has made it so that he's never really been able to appreciate life. And this concept will come back later. Now, when Logan and Morrison head off to the water pump, we hear Morrison explain that the super corn grown on the neighboring corporate farms tastes like shit, but that it's used for corn syrup that goes into the energy drinks everyone's been raving about. So for Logan, this further confirms the mystery for him. Now, I've already talked about the you know the drill confrontation in another video, but I just wanna point out how, again, Logan is really only lit with one source of light, the headlights on the truck. Again, the DP is using a single light source to highlight the physical details on his arms and chest, giving an overall less glamorous shot that makes this a grittier, more grounded scene. And then and this scene back of the house with Charles and X-24 is probably the darkest, most shockingly violent thing I've ever seen in a superhero film. And it's amazing to see how it all unfolds under Mangold's direction. It begins with Charles's emotional confession over his guilt over the Westchester incident, which plays out like Charles is about to be executed and he's confessing his crimes. But then when X-24 kills every member of the Morrison family, this feels more like a home invasion slasher film. Mangold actually said that he couldn't believe that he got away with this dark turn, going from a nice family dinner to this horrific violence. Now, I mentioned before how Mangold conceived X-24 as the darkest version of Wolverine, which really makes him the fiercest possible enemy for him. Really, the only thing that we could imagine killing Wolverine. In fact, there's some basis for this in the comics. There was a Wolverine clone named Albert that was a robotic clone developed by Donald Pierce. And it turns out that the number of claws that I noticed in the shot in the first trailer was actually important. It just applied to X-24 24 instead of my earlier theory that it was Doc in. Eh, fun while it lasted. And then this scene gets even darker with the back-to-back -back deaths of Logan's two sole companions from the start of this film. Charles bleeding out in the truck and Caliban going out in style with grenades. And Mengel said that he was inspired to kill off a 
major character at the end of the second act by The Cowboys, a movie where John Wayne dies in the middle of the movie, which was a huge deal because everyone was like, wait, John Wayne's dead? What the hell are we gonna do now? And then the surviving kids in the movie had to figure out things on their own, which is similar to what happens in Logan. And both Charles and Caliban's final words are significant. Charles mentions the boat that they were gonna buy, the Sunseeker, and Caliban turns Pierce's torturous phrase back on him by saying, beware the light. In both cases, these men are evoking light imagery in their final moments, signaling that even though this is obviously the darkest moment of the film, there's light at the end of the tunnel that will eventually vanquish their enemies. And I think this lost retirement dream of the Sunseeker living on the seas with Charles is what Logan is referencing when he buries Charles by this pond, breaking down and saying, it's got water. And let's talk about Hugh Jackman's acting here. He's really at the top of his game. And sure, these small emotional moments are perfectly restrained, but what really impresses me the most is his physical transformation throughout the film. Jackman said that he trained harder for Logan than he did for any of the other Wolverine movies. And you could definitely see it. As the film goes on, his exhaustion and deterioration intensifies, going from merely wounded and wary and tired to literally every breath and step he takes being strained as if they could be his last. And this is not easy for an actor to keep track of. Most films are shot out of chronological order, so Jackman had to prep for every scene by carefully adjusting his physicality so that he wouldn't look any more or less worn down than the scenes that would come before or after it when the scenes were all edited together. And that kind of discipline is definitely Oscar worthy in my opinion. Moving on, I like how when Logan wakes up in the doctor's office, the first thing he sees are these fish mobile things with the colors yellow and blue, the X-Men colors from the comics. And considering how much this version of Logan hates that depiction of the characters, it's almost like it's saying that he woke up in X-Men hell surrounded by these colors that he's so tired of seeing. And as Logan and Laura make their last weary leg of their journey to North Dakota, a lot of people pointed out how their relationship looks pretty similar to Joel and Ellie in the game The Last of Us. Now, I'm not certain if that was an inspiration, but you can definitely see the parallel in the character's looks, especially when Logan passes out in the car. I've also pointed out how the end game of this story is similar to the movie Children of Men, which is also set in a near future world with a fertility crisis where a weary hero reluctantly escorts a special young female, really his last hope, through a war zone to a safe haven, bringing harm to himself and those closest to him. Okay, moving on to this outpost. Now, it's interesting that those coordinates from the comic book actually lead to anything at all, right? So even if Eden doesn't exist as it does in the comics, the fact that they do lead to this lookout tower implies that whoever put those numbers in the comics did indeed have a plan to rescue mutant refugees. So who was it? Now, I go into one theory in my other video, but it's also possible that another group is behind this rescue operation. Apparently, in the credits, some people are saying that one of the camera units includes the term Alpha Flight. Now, I haven't been able to confirm this, but Alpha Flight is the name of a team of Canadian superheroes from the Marvel comics. And then when Richter communicates with someone over the border with the radio, it's a female voice saying, your asylum is approved. And some people are saying that could be Emma Frost, the White Queen. January Jones played her in first class before she apparently died leading up to the events of Days of Future Past in the 70s. But either way, in the comics, Emma Frost becomes an ally and she sets up a mutant haven, which some people are saying this could be where the kids are going at the end of the movie. But really, I'm not sure if either of those will end up being the case if there's ever any sequel that follows Laura and the other X-23 kids, but we'll see. Okay, moving on, during the foot chase in the woods, we get to see these kids in action. And a lot of their powers do seem inspired by mutants that we've seen before. There was Bobby, Bolt, who I talked about earlier, and Richter is an actual character from the comics. He can control seismic energy. And I don't know if it's just because his healing serum is green, but when Logan injects it and goes berserk, it's kind of like he's Popeye taking his spinach, right? <laughs> Hugh Jackman actually shared a video of himself recording Logan's audio for the sequence, and it's pretty amazing. <laughs> And then Xander Rice arrives to introduce himself to Logan, mentioning his father, Dale Rice, who was one of the scientists Wolverine killed at the Alkali Lake Weapon X facility in X-Men Apocalypse. But I love the decision to have Logan just kill Rice right in the middle of him explaining his evil plan. Because as we've seen, Logan already gets it. The radio collar, the newspaper headline, the corn farm. And now that Rice outright confirms that he's been slipping anti-mutant gene therapy into consumer products, Logan doesn't need to hear anything else. This
this guy's evil and he's got to go. Now, when X24 returns, a lot of people are asking how a wooden branch in the tree was able to impale Logan's adamantium skeleton. But from the look of the angle, the branch went through his lower torso off to the side, probably missing any adamantium, but definitely hitting vital organs, making this wound too much for Logan to recover from. Meanwhile, the death of Donald Pierce is a lot creepier, with the kids surrounding him and using their powers collectively to bury him in grass and freeze him and shock him and I think snap his neck. But it's appropriate that they be the ones to kill him, since he's arguably been more of a greater enemy to these kids than he really ever was to Wolverine. Anyway, back to Logan and X-24. It's interesting how Logan's adamantium bullet does go through the brain of Wolverine as he intended. It just kills a different Wolverine. And then cue the waterworks, because as Logan fades away, he finally connects with Laura as father and daughter, with her calling him daddy. And then he says this line. So this is what it feels like. Now, on the surface, Logan is talking about death here. The character has been fatally wounded and killed over and over, but he's never really been at death's door until now. And this slipping away is a whole new sensation for him. But another way to look at this is Logan is calling back Charles's advice to him earlier, and he's saying this is what life feels like. He has a family who loves him, and by destroying X-24, Weapon X Wolverine, the darkest part of his past that he could never get over, he's finally freed himself of his demons, and he can be at peace. He can finally just live, if only for just a moment. And the final spoken line of the film is Laura's emotional eulogy for Logan as they bury him by a pond, maybe connecting him in some way to Charles's burial site. As Laura quotes Shane's final speech to the kid in the movie Shane. A man has to be what he is, Joey. Can't break the mold. There's no living with the killing. There's no going back. Right or wrong, it's a brand. A brand that sticks. Now you run on home to your mother, tell her everything's all right. There's no more guns in the valley. This is really perfect perfect for Logan. Like Shane, he was a classic Western hero, a loner with a dark past that he could never really escape. As much as he wanted to, he could never really settle down with the family. He could only deliver them from harm and then go his separate way, leaving the kid behind crying, asking him to stay. But unlike Shane, this ending is not at all ambiguous. Mangle didn't want a, a coy ending that left things up in the air. So this is final. No claws popping out of the ground, no pebbles hovering over the dirt. And I this before, but I love how Logan says farewell to the character by surrounding him with kids, with Bobby holding a Wolverine action figure. I feel like we were around this age when we first saw Hugh Jackman play the character, and these kids take us back to this place emotionally as we say goodbye to the first of the X-Men who started it all. Okay, that's everything I found interesting in Logan. Now, again, there might have been some little Easter eggs and timeline stuff that I didn't cover, but honestly, that's not really what this movie's all about. But I've covered Logan pretty exhaustively already in my other trailer breakdowns and my other explainer video and the Deadpool preview scene video, so make sure to check all those out. And if you like this video, please hit like and subscribe to New Rockstars and share this video around. And check out our other videos which cover all kinds of stuff, including a bunch of Marvel properties. And if you really like this channel, you can contribute to us on Patreon. Thank you so much to all of our current patrons. You guys are awesome, especially you, Wilhelmina Ebison. You can hit me up on Twitter, at EA Voss, with any thoughts or theories you had about Logan, or you can follow New Rockstars on Twitter, at New Rockstars, for updates on our videos. Okay. Thanks for watching. Bye.